I thought I'd start this off by, rather than diving into the disruptive technologies, thinking a little bit about the persistence of cities and how, in some ways, they don't change very much. I mean, cities have always been machines for allowing groups of people to come together to do things that they can't do individually. And if you go back to the uh, peak of Uruk in the Sumerian city five to 6,000 years ago, it was there because it protected assets. It had a wall around it. It was for defense. It meant that you could trade. There was a point that people could go to where they knew that they could trade. It was a marketplace. And because of its density of population, it allowed specialization. So people didn't have to be generalists. They could get on with individual trades. And that model of a city has persisted down the ages. It might change a little bit. We tend not to put walls around them anymore. But there's still a question of defense, of being able to organize things so that people get the resources they need in which to function. And cities work if the advantages of corralling things together, sometimes literally, overcome the disadvantages, the extra costs, the extra complexity that you have to put up with. And this question of persistence of cities, we talk about cities as if we can kind of change their design. I mean, we're here in London in a city whose shape, much of its shape in the core, was set 2,000 years ago. You can go down into the cloakroom area in the basement and look at the Roman amphitheater that's down here. When the Great Fire of London happened, um, Robert Hooke and Christopher Wren had a master plan that was going to transform London into this beautiful place with you know, wide boulevards and great fora and squares and classical architecture. It's going to be terrific. By the time they'd drawn the design, the residents of London just rebuilt it the way it used to be. So you get this incredible persistence. So the point I'm going to make is that the the disruptive technology is going to be changed the way you manage the cities, what you do within them, rather than make huge impact on the cities themselves. The shape of many of the cities we have around the world has already been set and is remarkably difficult to shift. And cities always, over history, have been tackling the same kinds of challenges. We are cities all over the world. What do you need to be successful in the future? And they said kind of the obvious things. We need to have a good economy. We need a marketplace where people can trade. We need jobs for people. We need to have a great quality of life because if, our, if the city is unpleasant enough, no matter how wealthy it is, people will start to go somewhere else. And we need to be able to do that in a way which is flexible and adaptable and resilient. And these days, they use the word sustainable. They wouldn't have said that perhaps 200 years ago, but they would have talked about how you manage the problems of cities, how you deal with air quality, how you deal with waste, how you deal with the problems that come from cities. So cities have this persistence of what they're for, how they function. Their cities are a mix of people and the infrastructure that supports them. And the people are incredibly important. And as human beings, we don't change very much over time in what we're looking for. Now we have some additional challenges. The world is urbanizing. We've now passed that trigger point where 50% of the world's population is urban. Our cities are growing very rapidly. How are we going to make them work for the people who live in them? And we're faced with some additional problems. What John Beddington, the government's chief scientific advisor a couple of years ago, called the perfect storm population growth, climate change, and resource crunches all happening at the same time. And those are the modern problems we have to tackle in cities. And cities, probably over the last 20 years, have increasingly become the focus of action and political decision-making around the world. When you think about climate change and responses to climate change, you think about cities and the C40 cities and all those Bloomberg cities and the groups of cities that have come together because they're in the front line. They're the ones who actually face the challenges directly. Nations? Not really doing anything, are they? Cities are out there arguing about how they're going to fix the problem, how they're going to decarbonize, how they're going to deliver. So cities are right at the heart of this debate about the future world. So I'm going to mention two technologies and hopefully lead into the contributions from some of the other speakers. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Internet of Things and about energy ecosystems. So the Internet of Things, we all talk about it. I mean, everyone says, oh, Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine communication, it's going to be fantastic and all the rest of it. I just want you to think a little moment about how big some of these trends we're looking at are. 
So if you take the world of electronics and microchips and things like that, everyone's familiar with Moore's law. You know, number of transistors you can put on a chip doubling every roughly two years. And that's important, and we can see an end of it, but it's delivering us more and more computing power. Much more important is Kumi's law, which says that every 18 months, you halve the amount of energy you need to supply for the same amount of computing power. And Metcalfe's law that says that the value of a network scales as the square of the number of entities in the network. So we're starting, you, you know, in a few years' time, you could be realistically looking at sensor networks that are running off scavenge power, right? They're microwatt computing, substantial computing available at microwatt powers, so it can be tiny photovoltaics, little windmills, people walking on the street can be powering all this stuff. Mesh communication, peer-to-peer -peer communication, that completely transforms what you can do. And this is available at a few cents an item. So you start talking about densities of computational power in cities, which are at the moment unimaginable. We are not ready for this transformation. That's going to be huge. And it's going to power a lot of things. And some of the things my colleagues are going to be talking about in transport and the way we think about cities, the way we use cities, some of the great things that have been going on in Canary Wharf and will be happening in Wood Wharf of thinking about how you use rich networks of sensors to change the way we operate the city. So that's one area. Second area, very interesting, energy ecosystems. So I talk to a lot of cities who are basically worried about the lights going out. They look at the way national grids and grid systems and centralized generation works and says, you know what, in the future we can't rely on that anymore. So they're starting to think about what you do when you have distributed energy systems. You have distributed energy generation. You start thinking about every building as a power station. If the buildings are energy efficient and they can use their surfaces and, and hot sources underneath them to generate power, every building could be a power station. But that's intermittent energy, so you have to think about storage. What are the storage devices? Massive work going on, thinking about how we're going to store intermittent energy. Now we've got all these distributed sources and stores of energy. How is that going to work? People talk about the internet of energy, peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. Again, that will transform the way we manage and operate cities. Not what the cities are, not what they do, but how we manage them. And we're supporting one company who's done a calculation that says, if you look at the number of uninterruptible power supplies, not the domestic ones we have stuck under our desk, but the big ones that are in hospitals and, and data centers and things like that, and add all those together, there's huge amounts of storage power. They're looking, you know, can they make a market out of that? Can they share that energy? So, two big trends that are happening, going to make a massive change, but in the context of cities that are about people. So, the challenge is, the call to action, the thing to think about is what are we going to do with this? How are we going to use these disruptive technologies to deal with the environmental and, and pressures uh, and, and air quality and all those issues. How are we going to use it to tackle that? How are we going to create an even better quality of life so that our people are more successful? And how are we going to do that in a way which creates brand new economic opportunities that we haven't identified yet? Thank you.